Hello, it's your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, back for another episode of the History of Comic Books podcast, this time with part two of the history of Fawcett Comics. When we last left off, we uh, detailed the rise of Fawcett Comics, going from a uh, pulp magazine uh, publisher to creating the Fawcett Comics name brand, when, particularly with the most popular hero of the Golden Age, Captain Marvel. However, it wouldn't be sales that brought down the Fawcett Comics and Captain Marvel, but the legal system. The thing that would bring down Fawcett Comics was not a lack of sales, but the legal system. As National Periodicals, the future DC Comics, decided their flagship character, Captain Marvel, was too similar to theirs, Superman. This was a strategy implemented by National Periodicals publisher, Jack Leibowitz, who, upon seeing the success of Superman, hired one of the best copyright lawyers in New York City, Louis Neiser, to go after any comic they... Look, they look like the ripoff to success, and even assigned an editor, Jack Shift, to read every comic book full time just to find any similarities. It was not without merit, as several studios did try to take advantage of Superman's success with some true ripoffs. A notable one was Wonder Man in 1939, published by the infamous Fox Featured Syndicate and produced by Will Eisner, that was a panel to panel remake of the original Action Comics number one. The courts rightfully ruled this was a case of copyright infringement, despite Eisner actually perjuring himself to say it wasn't. Reportedly, Victor Fox, the owner of Fox Featured Syndicate, said he couldn't pay him his $2,000 fee for the comic unless he did so. But when they lost the case, Eisner never got the money anyway. Fawcett was even guilty itself with the character of Master Man, who first appeared in Master Comics No. 1, March of 1940. The series only lasted for six issues before National Periodicals sued, leading the Fawcett to drop the character and replace him with the more popular Bullet Man. However, when National Publications chose to come after Fawcett's flagship character, Fawcett decided to fight back, and it will be a battle to decide not only the fate of the company, but change the comic book it, his industry forever. Due to, due to a passing similarity to Superman, Fawcett was sued by Detective and Superman Incorporated over Captain Marvel. They first attempted a cease and desist in June of 1941, calling for Fawcett to cease publications of Captain Marvel comics, along with Republic Pictures, to end the release of the Adventures of Captain Marvel movie serial. When that failed, Detective Superman then sued Fawcett and Republic Pictures that September, and during the seven years the lawsuit took place, the company merged with National Comics to Publications, who was then named the sole plaintiff. National claimed that Captain Marvel's appearance and powers were too similar to Superman, with Fawcett countering that while the two were similar, they were not similar enough to be a ripoff of one another. In fact, during the lawsuit, Superman would actually acquire several traits of Captain Marvel from being able to actually fly, remember he could only leap tall buildings in a single bound, to uh, getting a bald scientist as a villain in Lex Luthor, similar to Captain Marvel's Dr. Savannah. To prove their case, National pres presented over 150 pages of Superman and Captain Marvel comic panels showing how Captain Marvel replicated many of the poses and stunts to Superman. Fawcett countered with panels from Captain Marvel performing the same poses in, in earlier strips, along with Popeye and Tarzan showing how Superman replicated those, furthering their case that the characters were similar, but not too similar. However, Fawcett employees gave contradictory testimony about how much Captain Marvel was supposed to appear like Superman, with more than a few recalling how circulation director Roscoe Kent Fawcett originally ordered the creation of Captain Marvel as he wanted a Superman but was a 12-year-old boy. Ultimately, the trial was decided on a technicality when Fawcett uncovered that the McClure Syndicate, who produced the Superman newspaper strip, failed to copyright several of them, leading to the judge to decide that the National had abandoned Superman's copyright and thus their claim was no longer valid. However, the judge did rule that Captain Marvel was an illegal copy of Superman. This was all National needed to keep going. National Comics Publications appealed the ruling in 1951 to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, with Judge Learned Hand presiding. Hand reversed part of the original trial's decision, ruling that Captain Marvel was an infringement on National Superman's copyright, but not the Superman strip under McClure. However, Hand ruled Captain Marvel himself was not an infringement, but specific stories and moments were, ordering the trial back to the lower courts to be worked out. After a 12-year legal battle, Fawcett ultimately settled with DC for $400,000 and ceasing publications of Captain Marvel and all related comics, which the company did in 1953. 
It was in large part due to comic book sales, specifically superheroes, declining on a whole, and Foster decided it was no longer worth it to keep fighting. Specifically, they would have, in order to satisfy the, the ruling from the appeals court, they have to literally go through every story to f- figure out what's the copyright and what's not. Fawcett ended up selling the rights to Hoppy the Marvel Bunny to Charlton Comics, along with laying off their entire comics division. Captain Marvel and the root of the char- and the rest of the characters would not see printing in comics for decades afterwards, though he would find some signs of life in their areas. Fawcett Comics would make a brief return in the 1960s producing Dennis the Menace comics based on the popular newspaper strip. In 1977, Fawcett Publications was purchased by CBS Publications for $50 million, ultimately broken up and absorbed into other companies. However, the legacy of its characters would live on, specifically the Captain Marvel family. L. Miller and Son, a, a British publisher of black and white Captain Marvel reprints, reworked the character into Marvel Man to continue publishing. Making his first appearance in Marvel Man number 25 in February of 1954, which replaced Captain Marvel in the title but kept the numbering, he was created by Mike Anglo with some similarities to the original character. This superhero was young reporter Mike Morin and uh, through the power of science, not magic, turned into Marvel Man by saying Kimoto, which was supposed to be Atomic spelled backwards. He would later be joined on his adventures by Young Marvel Man and Kid Marvel Man with a series running for 346 issues to issue number 370 in 1963. Marvel Man would ultimately be provided by writers Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman in the 1980s, with the rights ultimately following the Marvel in the 2000s, because it's an unspoken policy that all characters with Marvel in their name will be owned by Marvel. This is something that will be proved when Captain Marvel was revived by all things National Comics Publications DC Comics, but it would be with a catch. They can no longer use the name Captain Marvel. Otto Binder, the acclaimed Fawcett writer, would move over to DC Comics, working with specifically the Superman comic books, where he put his Captain Marvel influence on the Man of Steel, notably in co-creating Supergirl with artist Al Pastino in Action Comics number 252 on May of 1959, essentially Superman's Mary Marvel, along with co-creating the classic villain Brainiac with Pastino in Action Comics number 242 on July of 1958. Binder and Pastino would continue to have an acclaimed run in Superman, and for better or worse, created many of the super pets, from Crypto the Super Dog to Bippo the Super Monkey, along with introducing the Legion of Superheroes in Adventure Comics number 247 on April of 1958. During the Silver Age of comic books in the 1960s, Fawcett was unable to revive Captain Marvel due to their 1953 settlement with National Publications, which called for the company to never publish the character again. However, in 1972, DC publisher Carmen Infantino was looking to expand the, the company's the comic book line, so he licensed Captain Marvel and the Marvel Family characters from Fawcett for publication, agreeing to the deal on June 12th. Years of Captain Marvel stagnation, though, had, had led to the, his name trademarked the lapse, leading the Marvel Comics to snatch up the name when it created its own Captain Marvel in 1967. So instead, DC had the the comic titled Shazam, but with the subtitle The Original Captain Marvel, released on February of 1973, with the additional irony of him sharing the cover with Superman, the character DC sued Fawcett over to begin with. DC would soon have to drop the subtitle when Marvel's threatened to sue over trademark infringement, another irony in that DC had Shazam, they were now subject to the lawsuits over him. DC did take advantage of their multiverse when they introduced the Marvel family, saying they were on Earth-S and the entire run of Fawcett Comics were still, was still in continuity. Captain Marvel and his family's affluence was explained by Dr. Sivana, putting them in a suspended animation. Artist and co-creator C.C. Beck would even come back to DC to work on Captain Marvel in 1973 and gave Otto Binder a cameo in Shazam No. 1. However, Beck would complain the stories by DC were impossible to work with and unable to bring to life, unlike his past work at Fawcett. Kurt Schaffenberger, who was now working with DC on their Superman books, also did work on Shazam as well. DC later bought the uh, Marvel family and the rest of Fawcett's comic book line outright and would incorporate them into the larger DC universe after the Crisis of Infinite Earths event in 1986, where they have remained to this day. As for the rest of Fawcett's staff, many would continue on to successful careers. 
1977, C.C. Beck would win the Inkpot Award and was inducted into the Eisner Hall of Fame in 1993. By 1997, Beck was inducted into the Kirby Hall of Fame. Kurt Schaffenberger would have a long career at DC as well, working as Superman and Shazam. He would win the National Cartoonist Society Award in 1984 and the Inkpot Award in 1996. Ken Bald worked through uh, Jack Binder's shop on Bullet Man, Golden Arrow, and Crime Smasher. After Fawcett, uh, he later went to newspaper strips working on Judd Sexton, Dr. Kildar, and the adaptation of Dark Shadows TV show. In 2017, at the age of 96, he became the world's oldest comic book artist, along with the oldest illustrated cover, according to the Guinness Work of World Records. Ball would pass away two years later at the age of 98 on March 1st of 2019. Today, the characters of Fawcett Comics live on in D.C., with Captain Marvel, now Shazam, a mainstay in comic books line and outside media. Most significantly, he returned to live action on April 5th, 2019 with Zachary Levy playing Shazam and Asher Angel playing Billy Batson. The film was a financial and commercial success, spurring DC Comics to begin production on a sequel, along with a spin-off Black Adam movie starring The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Many of their other characters, from Spy Smasher to Bullet Man, have also been incorporated into the larger DC universe, though the Marvel family is naturally front and center, but all living past their original company, Fawcett's demise. And that is a rambling and too brief history of Fawcett Comics, who during the Golden Age was one of the top studios in the medium, only to be brought down by legal issues and changes in the industry. However, the work by his brilliant artists and their creations live on to this day, specifically with the original Captain Marvel and his family. Like all other industries, there are many companies who created things that have lived on past, long past they've expired, and Fawcett Comics is no different. I would like to thank the chief source for this episode, The Art of Fawcett Comics, a visual history by Christopher Bar- Brownlow. While light on the history of the actual company, it provides plenty of great art along with profiles of numerous artists that worked at Fawcett Comics. A great read for any comic book fan. are coming on the Nerd Bliss Podcast. We're changing up our presentation while keeping the candidness that you enjoy. We'll cover all your favorite shows and movies with maybe a few surprises along the way. And you, yes you, will have opportunities to be on our show on a regular basis. That's right, you've got the Zoom Pro account and we're going to use it. So be ready. Find us at nerdblisspodcast.com and esonetwork.com and on all the socials at Nerd Bliss Pod. Nerd Bliss, listen up. Now it is April 7th, 2022, time for the favorite comic book of the week, Wonder Woman Historia of the Amazons, book two, by Kelly Sue Connick and Jean Ha, that finds uh, Hippolyta, Wonder Woman's mother, seeking out uh, fellow uh, females to uh, find the Amazons and hopefully form their own tribe, only to incur the wrath of the Greek gods. This is another brilliant uh, uh, series by uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick that does a great job exploring both the, the history of pretty much a prequel of Wonder Woman, showing how the Amazons were formed over Hippolyta, and, uh, but also uh, showing how they were almost in many ways sometimes their own worst enemy, as one Amazon in particular does something that actually incurs the wrath of the Greek gods that could lead about to their downfall. It is matched beautifully by Jean Ha's gorgeous artwork, which looks great with brilliant details of the ancient Greek world, along with the gods themselves, who look immense and majestic as they should. And of course, it's done in this beautiful black label magazine format, so he has this beautiful, gorgeous, large artwork. Really shows off the art in general. And like, and so far, a lot of these uh, magazine label, black label books from DC have been fantastic, using the, the larger format, more mature content, and the, just the larger, you know, being able to show off the art. Just a must read, low price here, but well worth it. Like eight bucks, some of the best reading you'll ever get. Some of the, I don't even know some of the best comics we'll just get on the stands right now. So yeah, that's my favorite comic book of the week, Wonder Woman Historia, the Amazon's book two. Please check it out. And uh, join me again next week when we start off with a new uh, edition of the History Comics podcast. And until then, go out and enjoy yourself a good comic book. <laughs>